الحكم المستحدي ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضل فلا حادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا وحبيبنا وسندنا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Dear listeners um, I begin in the name of Allah Almighty, the most compassionate, the most merciful. Allah Almighty in the Quran and Kareem, there's a very beautiful surah in the third, 30th part. It's called Surah to Shams. It's named after the sun. Allah Almighty in that particular surah, He mentions, He says, وَالشَّمْسِ وَضُحَاهَا وَالْقَمَرِ ذَا تَلَاهَا وَالنَّهَارِ ذَا جَلَّاهَا وَالْلَيْلِ ذَا يَخْشَاهَا وَالسَّمَاءِ وَمَا بَنَاهَا وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا طَحَاهَا وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا صَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَالتَّقْوَاهَا قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا In this particular surah, Allah Almighty, He takes off from some ulama seven things or He takes off on nine things. And the reason why He takes off on these things, well, what does He take an off on? He takes an off on the sun, والقمر, the moon, the day and the night the earth, etc, etc. Some of the ulama say it's seven, some of them say it's nine. They bring in some grammatical issue in there. They say that some of the, the way the sentence is structured, it could be an oath on seven, it could be an oath on nine. But the fact is, that when a person takes an oath on something, if he takes an oath anyway, even if it's on one thing, then what's coming after is being stressed and emphasized. So if Allah Almighty was the creator of everything, he takes off on seven things or he takes off on nine things then that could clearly tells us that what he's actually taken off on the matter he's taken off on the jawab al qasam as they say in arabic grammar is something of extreme importance so the ulama of hadith of, of tafsir they mention that the seven things that he takes an oath on what comes after he says qad aflaha man zakkaha wa qad khaba man dasaha that success indeed lies with the person who purifies the nafs, who purifies the soul. And that, and that the person who allows it to be polluted is at loss. So Allah Almighty takes an oath on seven things, and after taking the oath, oath on seven things, He says that success, you know, some people measure success to be success of dunya, which is the worldly life, money, house, career. A job, something that brings the money in, a job that's got some sort of progression that you start off at one point and you move to another point and in, 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 eventually you become a chief executive of an organization. Some people measure success according to having a beautiful house, nice clothes, going on holidays, likes on Twitter or Instagram or on Snapchat, I don't know, streaks on Snapchat, uh, something like that, I'm not sure if my kids tell me. But Allah Almighty, He says that success actually lies in the purification of the nafs. And that the person who is not able to purify his nafs, he's at loss. What does purification actually mean? Purification means that as an individual, we all have, or we all are in, inclined towards developing certain spiritual illnesses, books, hatred, hasad, jealousy, Speaking bad about other people, having negative thoughts about other people, not being generous, to be stingy. We develop an idea or we develop habits that are contrary to what our deen teaches us. And we sometimes think that Sharia and the sacred Islamic law is confined to the actions of the limbs, wearing a hijab, having a beard, yeah? going for hajj, zakat, so on. But there's another aspect of the deen beyond that, which is the spiritual aspect of it, the ruh and the spirit and the ruh. Removing all the negative traits. It comes in a hadith, Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says on the day of judgment, three types of people will be brought in front of the court of Allah Almighty. Each one has come, carried out an action in the dunya with which, you know, the fadilat and the virtues of these actions are mentioned in the hadith time and again. One is the person who gave his life in the path of Allah. One is the person who who was extremely generous and he gave his money in the path of Allah. One is the person who taught the Quran his entire life. Each will be called and back, back to Allah Almighty. And Allah will like ask them, what do you do for me? And they shall enumerate everything that they did. And they said that the greatest thing that I did was that I gave my life. 
The greatest thing I did was that I was very wealthy. I gave my wealth in the path of Allah. And the greatest thing that I did was that I spent my entire life teaching Quran. Allah Almighty turns around and says to them, this is not the truth. You've not spoken the truth. Kadabta. Walakin fa'alta. You did this so that it may be said that fa'altu kaza wa kaza. So that it may be said that you did such, you, you gave your life so that it may be said that you are extremely brave. Not for my pleasure. You gave your wealth in the path of Allah, not for my pleasure, but so that it may be said that you're extremely generous. And you taught the Quran for your entire life to, so that people would say that what a great alim this person is, what a great, great knowledge he's got. He spent his entire life in the path of Allah. It wasn't for my pleasure, but it was for the, for the attraction of the dunya, for status. And then Allah Almighty, he says, that he gives them a punishment that they're thrown into the fire at that point. So the point here is, the ulama mentioned this hadith and they say that one small thing, the action was great, but the intention was incorrect. The situation of the heart wasn't correct. And because the situation of the heart wasn't correct, it impacted the actions that they did. When we pray Salah, do we pray for Allah Almighty? Do we have khushu and qudu? Or are we just going through the motions? So this ayat, this ayat that Allah Almighty mentions in the Quran, it carry, it explains this. In another hadith, Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Allah inna fil jasadi la mukta. That be attentive indeed in the body is a piece of flesh. When it's corrupt, the entire body is corrupt. And when it's correct, when it's correct, the entire body is correct. And then Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, This is the heart. This is the heart. So Allah, Allah Almighty, he sent the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam into the dunya for our guidance. You have the actions of the limbs, you have the beliefs, yes. But there's another third thing that he also sent us for, sent, him, sent the Prophet ﷺ for, which was correcting the heart. So today, Imam Ghazali, alayhi, he wrote a book, Ihya al We're actually going to go over a few sections where he talks about those things that spiritually destroy a person. And today's lecture really is just an introduction to the book itself and just mention a few things about Imam Ghazali. And the reason why I mentioned those surahs was because it's, this is what the crux of everything that he's talking about. Correcting the heart, bringing the heart back to what it should be, the equilibrium, the way it should be connected to Allah, the spirituality behind the deen. Not just going through the motions, but at the same time going through the spiritual situation. How should I be connected to Allah Almighty? And at the end of the day, the real reality is that the dunya is intransient. Yeah? It's going to finish sooner or later. It's not going to last forever and ever. It's going to come to an end. And then there will be a day when we, when we present ourselves in front of Allah Almighty. And that's the challenge. That is the examination that we need to pass. That's the test that we need to pass. And the dunya is the time for us to correct and make sure our carriage is on the right track. So imagine a scholar, a Muslim scholar, Imam Ghazali, who challenged the ideas of philosophers of his time. You know, Aristotle. Socrates, Plato, Plato, all these guys, he, he challenged their ideas in his time. He was a mujaddid, someone who revived the deen. Yeah? Many have passed away, but very few have left a mark like Imam Ghazali. His full name was Hujjatul Islam, Imam Abu Hamid, Muhammad Al-Ghazali. And they say in, that in a hadith, Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that indeed Allah Almighty shall send for the Ummah, at the beginning of every hundred years, a person who shall revive the deen. And they say that Imam Suyuti, one of the very famous Hadith scholars, uh, a Shafi'i from, uh, from Egypt, he says that no doubt Imam Ghazali was a mujaddid. And if you, were to conf if you were to explain his life works, what did he do during his life? The tajdeed work, the revival work, the revivalism that he carried out. So in one of the great sheikhs, Mawlana Abu Hassan al Nadwi, he mentions that it could be two things. Number one, he counted the growth of philosophy in his time. So you've got a period of time when the, the Greek philosophy, the works, the Greek writings on philosophy written by masters in their time was translated into Arabic and then slowly it had um, saturated the Islamic beliefs at that time and it had mixed up a lot of things and a lot of heretical groups started appearing within the Islamic body and there was a need for somebody who could actually challenge all of that. Imam Ghazali Rahmatullah through his writings, through his teaching he was the person who's credited with challenging them, not only challenging them, putting their arguments on their head. 
But the second thing that he did was, which was really important, was a piece of work around reforming Islamic society. Reforming Islamic society in the sense of bringing them back onto the pure teachings of Islam. Creating individuals who were connected to Allah Almighty, who had the mindset that in order to better the Ummah, in order to, in order to improve the Ummah, to improve our lives in the dunya, we need to be connected to Allah Almighty. And for this, he, he wrote a wonderful book, his magnum opus, extremely long book, something like 12 vol 10 volumes, I think it is, Ihal Muddin, The Revival of the Islamic Sciences. I'm going to go on about that in a little while. So let's put him into context chronologically. Imam Ghazali, he was born in 1058. He passed away in 1111. So his life wasn't very long. If you Im imagine the Battle of Hastings, William the Conqueror and uh, King Harold, and that took place in Hastings in 1066. Everybody knows that. So just a few years before that, Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi, was born. Just a few years, I mean, the capture of Jerusalem during the First Crusade well, took place in 1099. And Salahuddin Ayyubi, rahmatullah alayhi, you know, somebody whose name we all know, he was born in 1137, he died in 1193. They say, some of the ulama, they might mention, that Salahuddin Ayyubi, rahmatullah alayhi, wasn't just an individual who managed to militarily conquer or reconquer Jerusalem. He was actually part of a movement that began many years and decades before and he was the outcome of this revival, revivalism that took place and that was the outcome of the work and the effort of Imam Ghazali Rahmatullahi. So he was born in Iran, what's modern day Iran today, in a place called Tus in 1058. He died at the age of 53, only, 50, only 50, 53 years old. But he has a legacy that remains with us even till this day. His father was a very humble person, a shopkeeper. You know? uh, but he was particular on one thing something that was really particular, which was eating halal. Yeah? Not just confining himself to the halal sign. Yeah? Uh, not just confining himself to the halal sign, because you know what? They're sticking signs up, but you don't know what's behind it. That's another thing altogether. But you know, confining it to, to focus on the means from which the money's been earned in order to eat as well. Halal means. Yeah? We don't need to go into that. Some of, something that's just obvious. He was a very pious man, his father. He loved the ulama and the knowledge. He would only eat from the money, from the food that he'd, uh, he'd grow himself or what he earned through his own hands. And he would weave wool. He, you know, he, he, would, he had a shop, but he also used to weave wool, wool and he used to make money from that and he spent that money on feeding his children. He would frequent the gatherings of the scholar, scholars. Whenever he used to enter this gathering of an alim who was a, a mufti or a faqih, who specialized in fiqh, Muslim Masail, he'd make dua that he's Allah Almighty make my son a faqih. And then when he would enter the lecture, uh, the, the, the lecture of a person who was a wise, a person who lectured and talked about the heart, etc., he would make, to, make dua to Allah, that, oh Allah, accept my son as a wise, as a Sufi, as someone who's pious. Allah accepted his dua on both occasions. His first son, Muhammad, was an expert faqih himself, while his other son, Ahmed, became an excellent speaker and an excellent wise. But he died when his children were very young, so he left them in the care of a pious man. This pious man, he entrusted them with some money and he said, look after them and you know, teach them what you can, etc, etc. So this person, he taught them as much as he could, he spent the money, but the money finished. He was only very, he was very humble means, he finished very quickly. And he said, I'm a poor man, I spent everything that your father's left behind on on you for your education. I don't have any money myself. I, I think it's best for you to enroll in a madrasa. But the madrasas in those days were run by the state, the Sajjuk state, for example. And there was a place, there was a madrasa in, in, in the place they were born, known as Tus. So they studied there for a little while. They finished the studies there. Then they wanted to advance in their studies. So they went to another place called Jurjan. Imam Ghazali, rahmatullah, there's a story about his student days. He was returning from Jurjan back to Tus once when he encountered some bandits, some highway robbers, and they took everything that he had with him. Everything. They took his books, they took his money, they took his clothes, they just, they rinsed him left, right and centre, as they say. He says, Imam Ghazali Rahmatullah he says that I followed them for a little while because they had something that I wanted back. And when I reached them and I managed to speak to the leader 
I asked them, I said to them, I want, you can have all my goods, everything that you took from me you can have, but there's something that you have which I want you to return back. So the person said, what's that? He said, the notebooks. I spent so many years studying in Jurjan, and everything I learned, I wrote it down in the book, and I want my notebooks back so I can return back to those with that. So he, the bandit said, and he said something which really struck a chord with Imam Ghazali. He said that, how can you confine your knowledge to books? What have you learned? If I take your books away, I've taken your knowledge from you. You should memorize your knowledge. Your knowledge should be in your mind. So Imam Ghazali, he considered this entire episode not to be, you know, sometimes we, 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 we experience a difficulty in our life. And we take that as, a, as something to bring us down. But rather, he took a lesson from this situation. He went back with his books and he spent two or three years memorizing everything that he had he, written down until he was committed to his memory. Then he went to another place, another town called Nisapur, again in, in Persia, and he studied underneath a very famous scholar called Imam Jawini, who was given the title of Imam al Haramin. And they say, that he wrote a book at this time to his and he presented this book to his teacher and his teacher said to him that you've buried me alive in, in other words that you've written a book and you've superseded anything that i've written so he was a, he was a complete whiz he was very clever i could you not have waited till i passed away so this was the book that he wrote now there's a turkish drama um Sajuks. There's one called Erturul, and there's, there's quite a few, but there's one called Erturul, there's another one called uh, Seljuks, if anyone's watched it, I, I haven't. But there's a Turkish drama by that name, apparently, and there's a character in there called Nizamul Mulk Al-Tusi. Nizamul Mulk Al-Tusi. He's a character inside the drama, but he's actually a real-life person who, who, who was alive in the time of Imam Ghazali, rahmatullahi And he was the Grand Vizier of the Seljuks, if anybody has watched the drama. He was a very influential person and he set up a series of madrasas or universities under the, the Seljuk Empire at that time known as Nizamiya. And he was at one of those madrasas that Imam Ghazali Rahmatullah traveled and he, became, he enrolled himself. And later on when he graduated, he visited in Nizam al-Mulk who was encamped at a place in Nisapur. Lots of ulama had been gathered there at the time and they a debate took place on one of the finer rudiments of, of Islamic knowledge. We're not, we're not sure exactly what the debate was, but there was a debate or a discussion. It wasn't a negative debate, but it was a discussion on some ilmi point, on some Islamic point of jurisprudence or aqidah or something like that. And Nizam al who was a great scholar and alim himself, he was greatly overawed by this individual, Imam Ghazali. And he appointed him a lecturer at one of his madrasa Nizamiya. In fact, he appointed him as the head lecturer of the largest university or the largest madrasa they had established, which was in Baghdad, in the capital. So Imam Ghazali, rahmatullahi, he goes to Baghdad. He has the stamp of authority to be the, the highest, the, 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 the most senior lecturer at the Nizamiya Madrasa in Baghdad. And it was during this time that he started writing, and he started writing on fiqh, he started writing on maslahs, masail, he started, and he became known as the Imam of Iraq and Khorasan. And he wrote on some really difficult subjects, you know. He didn't just write about some easy subjects, baby books, children's books. In fact, children's books are quite difficult to read because you've got to pitch it in the right way. Uh, I studied journalism here. They used to say to us, at uh, Yukla, uh, so they used to say to us that writing for the Times or the Telegraph or the Guardian is easier than writing for the Sun newspaper. Because the Sun newspaper is so dumbed down it's really difficult to dumb yourself down to be able to write like that. I don't know if that's true or not. But anyway, Imam Ghazali, rahmatullahi, he began writing books on difficult subjects, philosophy, Shiaism, Tahfasul uh, Falasafa, one of the topics that he wrote on. And um, it was then, he's at the highest, the pinnacle of his career. He's at the pinnacle of his career, the top, the highest paying job for any alim at that time. He's got the highest position. You know, you can imagine university, or the best top universities, and someone's got research papers coming out left, right, and center, peer reviewed. They've been published everywhere. He's lecturing. He's the authority in his subject. And then all of a sudden, he, experience, he goes through a spiritual crisis. There's a lesson in this. We all go through a spiritual crisis. What do we do? Do we go left or right? Do we go straight? 
But we carry on. And that's the lesson in us, for us. So Imam Ghazali, alayhi, he's at the, pin, at the top of his field. And he decides all of a sudden to leave his position. And he goes off on a journey. He goes off on a journey. And he says that he excuses himself for Hajj. But he goes to Damascus and he stays there for 10 years. And I'm just going to read something out from his, from his book that I'm going to read in Arabic. He says, فَلَمْ أَزَلْ أَتَرَدَّدْ بَيْنَ تَجَازُ بِشَعْوَاتِ الدُّنْيَا وَدُوَائِ الْآخِرَةِ قَرِيبًا مِنْ سِتَّ أَشْهُرُ He said, for six months, I was in this spiritual crisis, this situation, where I'm being pulled to, for, to the dunya, and also on one side pulled to the akhirah. Because he's got a top job. He's an alim, yes, but he's also being paid well. He's got a very prestigious position. When he walks and talks, everyone takes atten pay, pay, pays attention. If he writes a letter to somebody, asking for something, he's answered, yeah? But then at the same time, his knowledge is also telling him that there's something else I need to be doing, which is working for the hereafter. And everyone's got a pull. Everyone needs to be pulled that way. So he, for six months, he's between the situation. And he says that the situation during this period reached its pinnacle. <laughs> He said, until a point came that I couldn't even speak. I couldn't lecture. He walked into the lecture room. He couldn't speak. Allah put a lock on his tongue. That's how he describes it. He says, فَكُنْتُ جَاهِدْ نَفْسِي أَنْ أُدَابِسُ يَوْمًا وَاحِدًا تَتِيبًا لِقُلُوبِ النَّاسِ الَّذِينَ تَرَدُّنُ إِلَيْهِ He said, sometimes I should try just to teach for one day. Just to make the hearts of the people who are expecting me to lecture happy. فَلَا يَنْتِقُ لِسَانِ بِكَلِمَةِ My mind. I wasn't able to say a single word. He, he, something has gone wrong in him. Allah distanced something for him to happen. And we all go through this situation. We go to a low ebb in our life. Yeah? What do we do in that situation? That's the question. Until he became extremely depressed, sorrowful. He's feeling low. Yeah? Husnan fil qalb. Yeah? Mahfuz? He's feeling sorrowful. The doctors, they're trying to cure him, but then they give up hope. They don't know what to do. Yeah. And then he's unable to do anything. And at that point, what does he do? He turns to the one who created him, Allah Almighty. He turns to Allah Almighty, the one The way in which a person who's completely compelled and suppressed, he has no strategy to get out of the situation, he turns to Allah Almighty. And there's a lesson for us in that as well. Then he says that the one who answers the person who's destitute, when he calls upon him, answered me. And he made easy for my heart to turn away from the status that I had achieved, the wealth that I had earned, the family that I had with me, and the friends. Then I expressed a desire to travel to Makkah. So he, you know, he couldn't just leave. He needs a strategy to leave Baghdad. How's this person who's one that, you know, renowned ulama of that time? who's going through a spiritual crisis, how can he just leave and say, I'm leaving my job, I'm going? He, he, makes, he, he comes out with a strategy. He says, I'm going to Makkah for Hajj. He does go for Hajj eventually, but he actually goes to Damascus. But I did this so that the Khalifa and the people of the government, etc. wouldn't realize that I'm actually going to Sham, Damascus or the Levant. And then he went very quietly in a way that I'm not going to return. I distributed all my wealth that I had. He was well paid. This was everything he had. I only left enough to suffice me for my needs. He goes on a spiritual journey. Suffice me for my needs and also enough to look after my children in my absence. So Imam Ghazali, he has a spiritual crisis and then he goes and he remains in this situation for a little while and he goes to Baghdad. He says that he, during this period he wrote a book, Ahiyah al the revival of the Islamic sciences. 
On the topic of him writing, he says that in his life he wrote in Arabic and Persian. Lots of subjects. subjects. And when he went on the spiritual crisis, what happened was he went for a period of time soul searching. He went to a sheikh to correct himself, bring himself back to where he needs to be, focusing on the heart. And during this period, he began writing again. And they say that he wrote over 400 books according to one estimate. Someone divided the number of pages he wrote. So you're talking about large, maybe eight, three side pages. The books, Arabic books of that big in those days, the manuscripts. You can see the Makhtutats, uh, the manuscripts in the libraries. So if you were to divide this over his age, they say he wrote four pages a day on average. But he was very humble at the same time. One of the biographers, in fact, this biographer in the Muqaddimah in the introduction, he writes, he says that he, 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 he writes that he was like a tree that bears a lot of fruit. The more fruit that the tree bears, the more it slopes like a humble person. That in spite of his, you know, his prowess in knowledge, etc., he will be at most humble at the same time. Bring himself low like a tree, fruit-bearing tree, which then lowers itself. We don't see many fruit-bearing trees in this country, but if you go back to uh, South Asia, for example, or you go to some other countries, uh, the Mediterranean, you see the trees, and when, when the time for man the, the mango season appears, the tree starts bending and sloping down because of the weight of the fruit. So the more it gives, the more it slopes. And that's the way a person of knowledge, that's a person of ilm should actually be like. So anyway, what is the Ihyalum al So the book we're doing today is al arbain fi usul al which is a concise summary of Ihyalum al his magnum opus, which is the ten volumes. So the Ihyalum al I'm going to mention what the Ihyalum al is. So the Ihyalum al details the nurturing of the ideal human being and his connection to Allah Almighty. It discusses the soul, what is slavery, and it's slavery to Allah Almighty, Ubudiyah, obedience, disobedience, praiseworthy and blameworthy traits. The purification of the heart, what success actually is in the dunya, what success is in the hereafter. And Imam Ghazali, rahmatullah one thing he's known for is, uh, his, 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 his writings have a sense of urgency, an understanding of key points about the temperament and the mizaj and the, the, the attitude of a person which other books don't cover. He discusses things in a practical, holistic way, and his conclusions and advice based, are based on impact in the hereafter. And everything that he writes, he writes in a very strategic way. He, he, you know, every, once we go over one, on one or two chapters, you'll see that he presents things in a logical fashion. And he presents what the problem is, and in the end he presents the cure or the solution. He tugs at heartstrings, you could say, he beautifies the mind, purifies the soul. But the one thing that he's always done is he's is inspired people. Many ulama and many scholars, for nearly a thousand years now since he's written it, I found this book extremely useful. It's published even now, carry on. But it's a large work, 10 volumes. So what Imam Ghazali, rahmatullah, they did, people don't have time to read books. Maybe 300 pages they can't read. They, have, they say, oh, we got a PDF, can you send me a PDF, please? Or can you just give me the summary? Oh, look, the article's too long. 800 words, 1,000 words, 1,200 words, 1,500 words, 2,000 words, too much. I can't read that. I just need a tweet, 360 characters. Is it 265 characters? <coughs> 265 characters, I think. Or TikTok it. It's even easier. It's, you know, it really go to the heart straight. So Imam Ghazali, Rahmatullah, in his time, he says, you know, nine volumes, that's what the, the, there's a print done in Saudi Arabia, modern print, a few years ago, beautiful print. Darul bin Hajj published it. It's 10 volumes. It cost me 150 quid, by the way. But 10 volumes, uh, but so what he did was he, he, he shortened it and he abridged it into one small volume known as Arba'in, the 40 principles of Deen. And there's four sections. He's got Aqeedah, belief, Amal al Zahira, and what Ibadah, the outer actions that a person should do, his, his, you know, the, the Ibadah. Then, Taskiyatul Qulub and Al Akhlaq al Madmuma, purifying the heart from the negative traits. 10, 10 parts in that. And then adorning the heart with praise, praise with your traits. In these four lectures, inshallah, we'll cover just one or two, three, 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 four subjects. I'm not going to cover the whole thing because it's too much for me as well. But anyway, we'll inshallah cover bit by bit. Um, we'll carry on a little bit, aren't we? Am I okay to carry on? Okay, I'll just quickly carry on. There's only a little bit left. Anyway, later in life, Imam Ghazali Rahmatullah returns to Baghdad and then to Tus after an absence of 11 years. Nizam al Mulk. Atusi Rahmatullah he asked him to take up teaching in Nisapur. He does for a little while, then he leaves it. But then 
his focus by that time has become something else. It's about purifying the heart. The soul. Sulub. Sufism. Yeah? So you know, Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hadith, hadith of Jibreel, very famous. Well, I will, I will come up, we will explain that another time. But Allah Almighty he says in the Quran and Kareem, He gives the, you know, when you walk into a meeting, you know, if you work for the council, you work for the NHS, I work for the NHS, you walk into a meeting, they'll have a terms of reference of the meeting. Everything this meeting is about. Or if you take up a job somewhere, they'll give you your contract and they say, this is, this, this is what you need to be doing, these are your objectives. So Allah Almighty, He sent the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with a job, yeah, into the dunya, to guide the people. He also gave him objectives. It's mentioned in the Quran, yeah. ayati <laughs> To recite the Quran upon them. That's number one. وَيُزَكِّيمُ I'm going to come to that. وَيُعَلِّمُهُ الْكِتَابُ وَالْحِكْمَةِ Three and four is to teach them the book, explain the book, the tafsir, the Quran, what it explains. وَالْحِكْمَةِ Wisdom, yani the hadith. But the second thing that he also came in to show was تَسْكِيَةُ الْقُلُوبِ Purification of the heart. Many of us go to the madrasas in the evening or we went to the madrasa in the evening. They taught us our aqidah. Yeah, the first kalima, second kalima, third kalima, fourth. Mashallah, very good. Then they taught you another thing, which was how to pray salah, how to fast, how to give zakah. All your fiqh was covered there. And then they tried to infuse in you spirituality. But then by that time, 11, 12, 13, 14, it doesn't ring a bell with you. It doesn't sink in. You leave and then you carry on with your life. And then whatever spirituality is going to come comes from your family. But this is another important science of Islam, which is explained in the Quran that this is one of the objectives of Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And inshallah, you know, I think it's a very long path. It's a very long path, but it's something that a person should taste, some soul spirituality, how to better yourself. And the first step in the purification process is to remove the negative traits. Then bring the positive traits in. How do you do that? And that's what we'll be covering in the next few lessons. Anyway, he took Tasawwuf and Suluk from uh, Sheikh al farmadi on a student of uh, Imam Kushari, rahmatullah alayhi. And then he passes away in 1111. He's only aged 53. I'm 43. going to be 44 this year. So 10 years on. Allah gives us a long life. And he bathed and worship. And then he says during the time of Fajr, at the end of the night, he spent reading the Quran. After wudu and, pray, and prayer, Imam Ghazali sat and he asked for his shroud. He kissed the shroud, he rubbed it on his face, and then he said, Oh my Lord. My king, your order is a blessing to me. And when he passed away, he passed away thereafter. When he passed away, he discovered a point near him. I'll just read a few excerpts of it in English. So he says, tell my crying friends who saw me dead. Tell my pain brothers and sisters in Islam. Do not assume I'm really dead. But Allah, keep away from saying it is a death. I am a sparrow and his body is my cage. I flew away from the cage and the body remained. I was like a dead man among you this morning. I lived for a while and then wore a shroud. Do not assume that death is permanent. Know that life, that it is life and is highly desired. Do not assume death is violence in pain. It's only moving from one house to another. Take what you need and be prepared for the road. Take what you need from the dunya and be prepared for the road. It's only moving from one house to another. It's only moving from one house to another. Take what you need and be prepared for the road. If you are smart, do not get busy with anything else. Pray for me to be blessed, so you are blessed. We went away knowing that you are next. Peace be upon you are my last words to you. May Allah save you. What else is there to say? So that's an introduction to the book itself. And then Imam Ghazali, rahmatullahi, after that, he goes into explaining the different, you know, there's different topics we're going to be covering. So inshallah, the first topic we'll cover uh, will be the first thing that annihilates. So there's ten, ten, 10 elements that Imam Ghazali identifies that destroy a person spiritually. And the first point that he mentions, so anyone got a guess? Shall I, shall I open the floor for people to guess? What do you think the first thing is that, that, could annihil, that Imam Ghazali mentions that annihilates a person spiritually? Any ideas? Mahfuz, any sisters, any ideas? Someone might turn around and say, any ideas, any hands? No hands up. Uh, and someone might turn around and say, it might be jealousy. Someone might say it's haram earnings. Someone might say it's, uh, it's uh, I don't know, you know. Overeating. Say that again? Overeating. 
when he's pointing you. So I says lots of things, but you know, the first thing is, is actually overeating. Overeating. And if you compare it to like diabetes, for example, high blood pressure, cholesterol, yeah? Once diabetes kicks in, then all the other illnesses kick in one after the other like, like a domino effect, yeah? It's like a house of cards. I don't know, I'm not really a medical type of guy. I'm just a simple guy. I did journalism. We don't really specialize in anything. We write about everything. But, but the fact is that Imam Ghazali Rahmatullah he identifies the first spiritual illness to be overeating. Why? You'll have to find out next week, inshallah.